All right. I'm going to reflect a little bit on some of what um, Michael shared. You know, one of the things that I really appreciated um, him starting with is that his career started not necessarily in technology at all, um, but in a space where he got lots of customer engagement through much more of a, a, re a retail track. And you know, most of you may not know this, but my degree is actually in history, um, early modern European history. That is not why I chose the castle and the moat, um, although I have rather liked castles and moats for a very long time. Um, you know, I think the journey that each of us have towards uh, technology careers, towards security careers, is often you know, a surprising one. And so I really appreciated that Michael shared where he started and the kinds of things that were foundational. And frankly, that was a running theme throughout his career in terms of collaboration and listening and, and really having that kind of customer delight um, in his career. I thought that was really cool. Hey, Donna, we've got yeah. an excellent question from Son Young in the chat. Hey, Young. Um, where do you think cybersecurity will be in terms of relevance in the coming years? Um, do you think it will ever be, will be even more important than ever, especially as we move to majorly digital, uh, majorly digital ecosystems? We've especially seen a more rapid shift in COVID times. So love to hear you speak to that. That's a great example, a great, great question. So thank you, Sung, for asking it. You know, I, it's just going to get more complicated and more interesting. At the same time, we're also going to get better and you know, the technology vendors that support us will get better at helping us to be able to combat it. Um, so things like artificial intelligence that we can bring to bear to understand trends and to try to anticipate what's happening with threat actors as they come in. You know, we're, we're just going to get wiser and wiser about how to use technology to help us defend against it. Um, but I think the truth is that our adversaries, you know, wake up in the morning on a 24-7 globe um, and this is what they do. Whereas for most of us who are in the profession, um, that is not what we do. <laughs> We're actually um, part of rather large ecosystems and trying to do digital transformation across our campuses uh, in really unique ways or digital transformation inside the NFL or inside an organization like Hearst. You know, our first and foremost isn't, um, isn't thinking about where protection is. So we've kind of, we're at a disadvantage in terms of how much energy our adversaries are spending on us. And, you know, as Michael said, for as long as we've got real challenges in terms of how we have any law enforcement against the bad guys, um, and for as long as we've got, you know, we're still learning how cryptocurrencies work, although that is the way you would pay the bad guys. So there's lots of work that needs to be done there before we would have been able to effectively mitigated our adversaries. So that being said, you know, the, the other component here I think that's really interesting is we have lots of legacy tech and that legacy tech isn't going anywhere at all. There's still foundational things. Uh, Printer Nightmare is a great example um, where if you had asked, you know, maybe a few months before, you know, where do we see the biggest uh, threats to arrive? I don't think printer spoolers would have been on the top of mind for most people, um, but we are a large campus and there are still printers. Um, there's still printers that faculty and students are using. Uh, we might have gotten really good about mobile printing so that they're printing on demand. The world of printing might have changed, uh, but there are still printer spoolers out there. And so how clever is that? Um, you know, really trying to think through what are the areas of technology that haven't transformed? And then how do we use these new lateral capabilities uh, to exploit those? That's layers and layers and layers of you know, technology that's built up over time um, that makes this even more complicated. So relevance, yeah, I think it's going to be relevant. I think it's going to, going to be more relevant towards even more aspects of uh, folks that today wouldn't necessarily think of themselves as cybersecurity. Um, so if you think of um, some of the folks that are in data analytics and the kinds of data that they're working with, security by default in the systems that they build, privacy by design in the systems that they build. You know, they aren't necessarily security practitioners 
Um, and a big portion of their job description might not have security in the title, but more and more and more, uh, these are going to be part of what they do with their day to day. And we're starting to see our cloud vendors like AWS and, and Google um, get more proficient um, with how they're able to give us tools and give us kinds of decisions for navigating that. Um, but I think the, the basic level of um, savvy and having some competency in cybersecurity is going to be something that almost every, every career touches. Hashtag COBOL, yep. We have Jocelyn <laughs> asked us another question. Let's see, former elementary education grad here, <laughs> given the rapid changes in social media and tools like Facebook, Instagram, TikTok being easily accessed by younger audience audiences, where do you see cybersecurity awareness and education come in specifically for K through eight audiences? Great question, Joss. Oh, it's such a great question. Um, so there, there are a couple different efforts at the national level. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I got to hear Jen Easterly, who is the new director of CISA. Um, CISA is at the heart of National Cybersecurity Awareness Month, and they have a lot of efforts specifically targeted towards K through 12 research uh, resources. So if you have um, teachers that are struggling with this today or parents that are struggling with it today, um, CISA's already got a lot of really great resources in K through 12. And they're starting to think very creatively about how we, we might expand that. So one example, and this was um, a conversation uh, amongst a handful of CISOs that I met with in DC a couple weeks ago. One of the things that CISA and, and institutions like uh, the federal agencies are thinking about is a kind of um, reservist role uh, for cybersecurity professionals, where there would be a formal mechanism by which a cybersecurity professional could actually help out, say, the local education agency and have a mechanism by which they could come in in a consultative way, almost like a cybersecurity core of volunteers um, to help the agencies who really struggle with this talent and dispersing the talent as broadly as they need to across a lot of different school districts or community colleges or just take K through 12, it's really complicated. So I love that. I love that we're thinking at both a federal and, and you know, local level at how do we start getting better and back to some of the stuff that Michael was talking about. Like, I love the fact that Atlanta brought together all these CISOs to try to figure out, okay, how do we band together and bring together our threat intelligence so that we're really well prepared for an event like the, like the Super Bowl. Things like the um, a cyber core of citizens that can come to bear and help out schools. That's a great idea and a great way for us to, to think about how personally, if we do have ways that we could help, we'd be able to give back. So that's, that's kind of on the institutional and civic side of it. Um, on the personal side of it, you know, I kind of wonder, and my own kids are all in their 20s, um, so it was a big deal when they got, you know, cell phones when they were 10, um, but, uh, but I don't know if kindergarten's early enough to start really thinking about how children in your own, um, your own space and your own sphere of influence, how those children might actually be interacting with the devices that they see. My own nieces and nephews, little people in my life, um, are gravitating towards devices you know, much earlier than kindergarten. By kindergarten, they're pretty darn savvy. Um, and how are we doing on time? We're doing all right. Um, I was with my niece this summer and she was on TikTok, um, looking at things that kids would look like on TikTok. And her TikTok got really dark, really fast. Um, really dark, really fast. So Auntie Donna kind of scoops in, takes the phone, takes a look at the settings that, uh, that she's got for that environment. Uh, we basically set up a couple really easy places for her to reach. So she's got uh, kids YouTube right available. And so there's some protections on her phone. Um, but frankly, like that's not, it's not obvious to do that. And you may not even be aware that the way the algorithms are really thinking about the kinds of search patterns aren't considering that you might actually be, you know, four or five years old and the algorithms might need to shift for that age group because the phone's probably owned by an adult. So it's, uh, I think it's really, really important that we're mindful of that and that, you know, we encourage and kind of celebrate a bit of digital fluency for how we can set up our own environments to be able to create places that are creative and playful and full of discovery, uh, but also really, really safe um, for our own little people. 
Uh, what's this next question, Annie? Yeah, we could talk about tick. We all have a whole session on TikTok sometime. <laughs> I was just curious if there's an idea of the scale of the work that we are doing to keep our communities protected for someone, you know, who maybe isn't in the day to day. You know, what does that look like month, year? Is it hundreds, thousands? Uh, Karina, do you happen to have handy or one of our CNC team, do you have handy the numbers that we just shared with the deans? Could we pop up the slide where we share the fourth quarter numbers for the deans? Let me see if I can track down that really quickly. I also can throw in the chat our recent by the numbers, which mm -hmm. has some of the information around protecting. Um, so there we go. You can go there. And if you scroll down to protecting, it shows, I mean, these are just incredibly huge numbers. They are incredibly huge numbers. Um, by an extraordinary, um, talented, and very committed team. You know, it's not a huge team that's um, that's doing all of this work. It's it's really a tiger team of of folks across the campus and inside of UTO that are doing it. But yeah, um, take a look at the number of commas in that eighty one billion. Incredible, and the uptick, the increase in that number. And this, this is fourth quarter numbers. So these are numbers over the course of the summer, which is not our busiest number. Um, that's fourth quarter academic year. So I'll, I'll be really curious to see what these numbers end up being like as we just come off of our largest enrollments um, from, the, from the year, which is a great segue into our next session where we're going to bring our student panel together. Yeah, we've got about one minute. Are our students all ready? Dr. Yes, Summers? all here. Is Dr. Summers well caffeinated? I am well caffeinated, but my Zoom right. is weird. So let me turn off my video <laughs> for just a moment and see if it catches up. Sounds good. I am so excited to, uh, to have the students that we have here with us today um, and the diversity of voices that they bring, the incredible expertise. Um, you know, we got together a little bit with them to pregame for today, and I just sat back in awe of the kinds of questions that they're asking and the way they're thinking about it. I'm really excited about this next session, Timothy. So am I. So am I. I am, I'm going to uh, hand it over to you. Thank you. Um, and let's see how this works out, guys. Like right as Donna was passing it over to me, my computer started acting weird and my Zoom started like going really slow. So I'm going to try to close some things and continue on until you tell me that you can't hear me or see me anymore. You sound great. <laughs> Couldn't tell anything was happening. And cool. of course, as I say that, it hiccups a little bit, but no, you're, you're fine. Well, I'll just keep rocking with it, man. The show must go on. So you might see me turn my video off uh, sporadically just to catch up, but I'll continue going. So I'm gonna uh, jump right in here. I'm super excited about today. Uh, you know, this is, um, you've already heard that October is Cybersecurity Month. Um, as, you know, uh, cybersecurity, someone with a cybersecurity background is incredibly passionate about it. Uh, this is just an incredibly exciting time for me. And, you know, we're joined by some really, really amazing folks. Um, you know, we've gotten a chance to talk about cyber a little bit. And I gotta say, just, really, really uh, fun discussions and conversation. And for me, it's just always really fun to hear perspectives from uh, the, you know, what I always consider fresh perspectives and fresh appeal. Um, so, you know, I'm Timothy Summers. I'm executive director of uh, product development digital trust here at ASU. Um, and what I'd like to do is just uh, ask uh, everyone to, to, you know, just quickly introduce yourselves, share your name, uh, you know, just a little bit uh, about uh, the institution or school, the school rather, where you're where you're doing your studies, uh, your interests, and kind of why you decided to join this event, and what you think about cybersecurity. So uh, we'll just get started. Um, you know, Harsh, you're right next to me, so maybe you can uh, get us kicked off. Of course, um, you can hear me all right. Yeah. You awesome. Um, so I'm Harsh Tekwani. I'm currently a junior undergraduate studying computer information systems and business data analytics. Um, I decided to attend this event and be on the panel, mainly because cybersecurity is such an interesting field to me, and I've been learning a lot about it over the past six months. Um, and I just think there's so many different routes that someone can take when they do get into cybersecurity. Um, and I thought this would be a great way to just hear different perspectives. 
Thank you. Whoever's ready to go next. Um, Claire, you're right next to, to Harsh if you're, if you're ready. And then please just continue on after that, guys. Uh, so my name is Claire Pettison. Um, I am in my last year, year here at ASU. I am an economics and data analytics uh, double major in WP Carey. Um, I'm also the president of the ASU Esports Association here at um, ASU. So um, cybersecurity is really a big part of um, esports in general. Um, I don't know if you guys had heard this morning, but Twitch had its entire source code leaked on 4chan. So um, very relevant for me right now. So that's uh, very good timing to talk about it again. And thanks for dropping that uh, nugget uh, here, Claire. That was actually a big one. Christopher, how about you? Uh, I, was gonna say, I guess I'll go next. I'm on my screen right next to her. But uh, yeah, my name is Christopher Earls. Uh, I'm undergrad studying computer science um, with a, a focus in cybersecurity. Um, I think it's the School of Computing and Augmented Intelligence now, um, part of IRA Fulton Schools of Engineering. But uh, I heard about the event through a coworker. I'm a student worker um, with the UTO doing desk site support and just thought it would be um, interesting to be part of this because I am an older student um, pursuing my degree, you know, a little later in life. So I thought I might be able to give both a student perspective, but also um, generational difference or a slight difference there. So um, I think my interest in cybersecurity came from, I have a grandma who's like 95. My grandpa has been gone for quite a number of years. She lives by herself. And uh, I, I've heard of, you know, different retirement homes that have been hacked and it really affects um, older people. And that piqued my interest. And um, yeah, I just think that being able to protect ourselves and um, the vulnerable people among us from malicious actors is uh, a good thing to study. I'll go ahead and go next here. Um, my name is Hallie Shukai. Um, I'm currently a senior majoring in computer science, uh, part of the Fulton Schools of Engineering, as well as double minoring in mathematics and business. Um, I'm also doing the four plus one track, so that should be fun. Um, but I've had a pretty big passion for cybersecurity for uh, just about the last five years now. Um, and I'm always looking to learn more and educate others on uh, safe cybersecurity practices. Um, kind of where I see myself going with cybersecurity is uh, I love understanding the why and the how of uh, adversarial attacks and, and getting to the nitty gritty of what caused them to do these things? So I'm definitely looking to go down that forensics path. Hello everyone, my name is Song Jung and I'm a junior here at the, uh, undergraduate junior here at the New College of Interdisciplinary Arts at ASU West Campus. I'm in my applied computing degree with a focus on cybersecurity and I'm really excited to be here just because I think that cybersecurity is a very important topic nowadays. And if I have any way to share my own unique perspective on it, I think it'll be great to try and get it out to a wider audience. Absolutely. No, thank you so much, uh, guys, for sharing your backgrounds. Uh, like you, uh, very similar, uh, starting uh, from thinking about community impact, thinking about, you know, my, my, you know, aunts and uncles who have, you know, no idea how to protect themselves online. And I think that resonates with all of us, even thinking uh, back to the story that uh, Donna shared with us earlier, I think it was about her niece. So, you know, there's, there's a, a lot of really amazing value here around cybersecurity and digital trust, as you pointed out. Curious, uh, what are your thoughts on the biggest misconceptions or misnomers about cybersecurity? And, uh, you know, maybe uh, share some clarifying points that you've seen in your experience so far. Uh, let's start with you, SJ. I'm sorry, the video cut out for a second there. Who did we want to start with? Let's start with you. Let's go there. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Um, I, I think one of the biz biggest misnomers that I'm uh, aware of, and I think it's partly because it was one of my own misnomers coming into this, is that... Um, a lot of people don't think much about cybersecurity because they don't think that anybody would target them, like they're not worth targeting or whatever. But um, I think a lot of cybersecurity incidents, um, people aren't targeted, it's it's phishing, and they just clicked on the wrong link at the wrong time, and they got some malware on their computer, and ransomware, it, you know, these people can ask for a couple hundred bucks, and if, if you don't have a backup, it might be worth it to you. And so people keep paying. And so people keep sending out these phishing links. And 
yeah, I, I think people just need to be aware that um, we need to have healthy habits, password managers, um, two-factor authentication and things like that. But yeah, most people aren't targets. They just got caught. I think for me, one of the biggest uh, misconceptions I had uh, originally coming into cybersecurity was um, it was solely about hacking. And after a lot of the experiences I've had, um, I had a previous role working with vulnerability management, which is um, a lot more focused on uh, the analytic side of things, not so much the offensive, but the defensive side. Um, cybersecurity really does involve a lot of uh, analysis and uh, clear documentation um, and automation to ensure that um, technical skills are, are able to communicate to others who might not have those same technical proficiencies that a cybersecurity expert might have. Yeah, to expand on that point, I think that um, a lot of people might think of cybersecurity, the way it's portrayed in media, it's kind of like a hacker-based orientated um, field, right? But I personally find that cybersecurity really encapsulates a lot of different disciplines. Um, especially on the social side, you need to be able to communicate um, all these different threats to all these different vulnerabilities. You need to be able to understand um, the conditions that led these vulnerable groups to be vulnerable in the first place. And how can you find a solution that fixes the, the very roots instead of the upper tops of, you know, uh, finding solutions in the, in a way that really addresses the core, you know, parts of the story, not just the surface level. Yeah, um, I would say the biggest thing that I've heard um, from people is just the idea that cybersecurity obviously is just hacking and also the idea that computer science and cybersecurity are essentially the same thing. I've heard that from quite a few of my friends, um, you know, throughout the time that I've been interested in cybersecurity. And I do think that there's a little bit less of that information of the amount of depth that goes into cybersecurity and um, the different fields that um, are within cybersecurity. I feel like people, you know, kind of have a um, very blanket, I guess, um, understanding of what cybersecurity is. Very, very valuable points, guys. And, and you're so spot on about this, right? Uh, you know, th there's one thing that has been for certain. It's that cybersecurity uh, covers a lot of different fields and a lot of different areas. Um, you know, so, you know, leaning into that a little bit, you know, let's talk about, you know, sh share with us what role trust and transparency play in your day-to-day -day learning and working. I think transparency and trust is a really big factor when it comes to, um, especially in the workplace, it is so valuable to have, you know, you do this work for this cor these corporations, but they need to be transparent enough to acknowledge their mistakes and to also incorporate solutions instead of carrying on with the, what they're doing. It's not very helpful for cybersecurity analysts to create solutions, but for them to never be used. And I think that in the field as a whole, learning about this transparency is a really big deal because you need to be able to trust in a way, especially if you're a student, right? You should feel confident that ASU has your support and you should not be doubting yourself about, you know, is it really safe to do this or is it really okay to do this? And I think that on top of that, um, we should also be critical about these type of things. I think that everyone has a responsibility in some way to think about the services they use and then think about how do they work in order to protect your data in a way, right? Because it's very important, especially um, with what's happened recently. And I think that um, Claire can provide a bit more on that. Yeah, so in addition to like having ASU and your workplace, um, making sure that your data and all of its um, intellectual property is safe and secure. Um, it's also with all these companies, so you don't really realize how much information you put out, like your credit cards. I mean, it like you don't even consider banks just as the um, financial institutions. I mean, Twitch has um, is probably one of the largest banks because it has its own currency. It's connected with Amazon um, and 
today it was just um, its source code was released and it was part one was the title. So there's more, probably more to come. Um, so far, it hasn't been any user accounts. It's mostly been um, daily Twitch operations, but Twitch operations are what like make sure like we're secure and if it, the cybersecurity is part of the source code. So being able to trust Twitch and have them be timely in it, letting you know that your information has been breached is a huge, it's, it's, yeah, as we're entering a digital age, we need to start to trust these companies more and um, make sure we can rely on them. And Claire, to expand upon that as well, I think one of the primary aspects of cybersecurity is trust. I think the, the root of cybersecurity is trust. How, how are we supposed to log into Facebook or log into social media without having some sort of trust that this is the true, uh, the true link to log in, or this is the true website. It's not um, either a fraud or just kind of a, a spoof uh, website that's showing up. Um, we really have to uh, rely on um, trusting and, and having that faith in uh, developing companies um, where, where we ensure that, uh, and we kind of trust that whatever they're saying is true, we kind of have to just take it for face value and, and say, okay, you know, I'll, I'll accept it for what it is. Really great points. This is, uh, you know, really fascinating. And Claire, you know, you brought up the, uh, the, the Twitch situation. Um, wondering, you know, as you're thinking about cybersecurity, uh, you know, and you're thinking about the field and what you're seeing happening out there right now, where do you see equity fitting in, you know, when it comes to cyber? Where, where does equity really play a role in the story? Perhaps we can start with you, uh, uh, Hallie. Let's start with Hallie. You know, I have a hard time believing uh, there is equity in cybersecurity. Um, on one hand, there are uh, a lot of uh, mass um, target scams that are being sent out. But a lot of the time too, um, you know, we, we say that equity is focused on providing fairness for all. And we can't say that's true when uh, women and children are more likely to experience specific uh, cyber attacks over uh, men might, such as uh, sex exploitation or human trafficking, um, or uh, older generations are more likely to experience um, those phone scams with AARP or Medicare um, and POC or, or women of, uh, of color particularly are so much more likely to experience hate crime and cyber stalking um, than those who, who are not. Thank you. Yeah, I, oh, go ahead, Chris. Uh, I was going to say, I agree with that 100%. Um, I, I think at one point I had thought that there was equity in the indiscriminate way that people attack. And I think the equity ends at um, they, they might not target people in a certain sense or uh, for a certain type of attack. But I agree completely that there is inequity in people that might not have the same education or um, in targeted attacks, obviously there's going to be a demographic that they are targeting. So there is still a lot of inequity. Uh, in, yeah. Um, but yeah, so the, the, the sense of, of equity there, again, ends when, um, when they start to become targeted attacks. You know, you guys are actually bringing a really interesting point to, um, and, and just to you open this door, you know, you, when we talk about equity as well, a lot of times in cybersecurity, we also have to talk about the equity of the positioning where the attackers and defenders are starting as well. If you're thinking about it from that perspective, there's a lot of different ways to slice equity. And we know that cybersecurity has many inequities, uh, especially as it comes to some of the topics that Hallie mentioned. Um, you know, this is a, it's, it's an interesting uh, question, this concept of equity in cybersecurity. You know, Harsh, do you have some points that you'd like to add in as well? Yeah, of course. Um, I think definitely when it comes to um, what Hallie was talking about, um, a lot of these people that do these attacks and do these phishing things, um, they don't have they're not individuals. A lot of the times it's, you know, teams of people that are trying to get these attacks through and get, you know, take advantage of these people that they're trying to take advantage of. And so it's crazy to think that, you know, 
these people are doing this as their jobs and they're going so far as to identify the communities that they can take the most from um, and benefit the most from and take advantage of the most. Um, so I would just say, you know, obviously I don't believe that there's that equity in there um, inherently. And I think that's, you know, one of the hardest problems to solve when it comes to cybersecurity as a field, um, because there's always gonna be people that are gonna try to take advantage of those that are in, um, you know, uncompromised positions when it comes to um, whatever they, you know, you know, their background might be. No, absolutely. This, you know, we're we're also have talked a, a bit about digital trust. You know, I mean, we've heard Donna, our, our chief information security officer, talk about digital trust. You know, we we have many conversations around it. Um, pardon me, Donna is our our chief information security and digital trust officer. I want to make sure to add that piece because. Uh, that leads into our, our next sort of aspect of the conversation. And, you know, do you guys talk, you know, with your friends, peers, or family about uh, digital trust uh, in the sense of, you know, the groups that you, you know, the organizations you do business with online or maybe other groups? And I think, you know, someone even brought up earlier in the conversation that, you know, hey, you have to protect, you have to, you know, uh, sort of put your trust in these companies now. Curious what your thoughts are there. And, um, you know, I, I kind of want to, you know, uh, not necessarily pick on us a little bit, but just say, you know, hey, if you're talking about ASU or your institution, you know, what kinds of things would you want to know about the data that we have as well? Well, I can definitely attest that uh, my entire esports community is talking about this right now. Um, mostly they're very worried. Um, what part two is going to entail because um, we use, especially all of the conferences that I'm also involved in, um, we all have our own Twitch accounts and that's a little concerning. Um, as for my like family as well, uh, my, I don't think my dad will even show his driver's license to people. Um, so they're like, definitely the older generation is also very concerned. Um, they don't trust anyone, especially if, People still have grandparents who lived like through the Great Depression. Um, as far as ASU, um, mostly I'm more concerned um, about my financials. Um, my student loan is connected to ASU. Um, but, like, there's a lot of information. They have all of my government information because it's a state school. So I just want to like make sure that if that gets breached what will happen. You know, I think something interesting there, Claire, that you brought up was uh, the worry of financials. And I was having a conversation with one of my coworkers the other day, and he brought up such an interesting point that I had never even considered before. Um, you know, as much as a pain uh, financials are when, when there's a breach and, you know, calling credit card companies and getting that information back, I think even more the question is what happens when you lose that ASU email that's connected um, you to your ASU platform and to Canvas and to all of these resources and tools that we use in our everyday lives? What happens then? You know, what if we get locked out of our emails? I mean, this is actually something that, you know, we've spent a lot of time thinking about. And, you know, you, you bring up some points about, you know, the sort of generational differences in terms of this concept of digital trust and, uh, and, and really the kind of story we need to be telling there, right? Um, when you think about uh, cybersecurity, and, and actually let's take it a little further than that, because you talked about, um, and, and thank you for sharing, you know, Claire, you shared exactly some things that you're thinking. You said, hey, look, I'm not really so much concerned about this, but this is the place where I'm really mindful. Um, we're working on a lot of different things to really sort of give learners their agency or ensure that they have their agency. What are your thoughts around actually owning and having agency and choice of disclosure over your data? Uh, you know, love to hear from everyone about this actually. Um, as far as owning my own data, um, it's, Data has become, I think, more than just like ones and zeros, right? They've become, as we, again, as we enter a digital age, they 
really become our entire lives. Um, like my bank account. Um, I don't go to, I don't have a brick and mortar bank. I use USAA and they're completely online. Um, so that's just complete data. Um, but it's also all of our data is being held in private institutions. Um, so when we sign those terms and conditions and read them, um, what does it actually say? And um, that concerns me that different companies and different private institutions could have different, um, different intentions for your data. Like all these free services, they're not really free. They collect data on you and then they sell that data as well. I think one thing to mention when it comes to that is a lot of these um, companies and softwares that we use, once you sign those terms and conditions, they like to give you kind of an illusion or illustration of having safety and asking you, would you like us to track so-and-so specific thing? And you know, you, you might say no, but who knows what else they're tracking, right? I mean, there's so much different information that a company can learn about you. Um, specifically, I remember one time I uh, looked at Google's, all the information that Google has on you, they have a little website where you can go and see basically the profile that they made about you. And it's crazy to think over, you know, the hundreds of thousands of Google searches that you make in your life, they're able to essentially know who you are as a person and, and be able to understand what would interest you and, and send you targeted ads because of it. Any other uh, thoughts to add to this one? Yeah, I feel like I, I I think there needs to be more transparency. Um, like Claire was saying is we, we do sign a user agreement and um, I read those very thoroughly. <laughs> um, no, I, I'm, I'm sure it's laid out in that, but it's, it's so easy to just kind of click through that stuff when you sign up for something. And, and like she mentioned is it's a free service in that you don't pay any money, but they take this data that they collect on you and they can make a lot of money on that. And I, I feel like um, it would be, more honest of these businesses to be more upfront about that kind of thing and say, hey, like if you don't want us to use your data as a currency, then maybe you can pay like a small fee. We won't collect data on you or whatever, or have like different levels of, of um, joining up with these things. Cause yeah, I mean, they're, they're making a lot of money off us and it doesn't, I don't think provide the same kind of benefit to us. Uh, I think we should have more agency over the data that's collected about us. I think something really quick in addition to that as well is it's not just uh, your name or your birthday that they're collecting. It's also those um, statistical patterns. Uh, you know, if, if you do a mobile order for a specific restaurant, they're, they're aggregating that data on is this person showing up on time or are they showing up late? And if they're showing up late, we can put them further down in the queue. Things like that, we have to understand that it's, it's not just, um, you know, things that are apparent. It's kind of our behaviors as well that are being tracked and aggregated um, as well. I just want to add one quick thing, um, mostly because it's a documentary that I watched on Netflix called The Great Hack about Cambridge Analytica. Um, and one of my favorite documentaries actually, because it illustrated how um, Cambridge Analytica from a psychological like fun quiz through Facebook was able to access everyone's Facebook account and then use that to influence your decisions based on targeted ads. And that's like what Holly was saying, like it's learning your behavior in order to influence you. And that is scary. Actually, uh, uh, Claire and Hallie, I'm really glad you guys brought this up. I'm actually uh, uh, putting a link right now into the chat here. If anyone's interested in taking a, uh, a an assessment that uh, essentially does what Facebook and Cambridge Analytica were doing, uh, there's actually a, uh, I did some research on this and we actually created a tool that you can use to actually see what kind of data and psychographic data uh, they were mining. It doesn't save any, but if you're just curious how that stuff works, the mechanics, the psychographics, you can take a look there. Um, in terms of looking into, uh, you know, I'm not really directly familiar with the curriculum at ASU um, and all of its intricacies. We have a very massive enterprise, but you know, when you're thinking broadly. Um, what are some things that colleges and universities could do uh, in terms of educating 
uh, the broader student population around digital trust and cybersecurity. Um, and, and let's add privacy in there as well. And you guys have any thoughts about that? I think one of the easiest and, and um, most obvious solutions is those phishing emails that are, are most, um, most often sent to employees and organizations. Um, Arizona State is the largest public university in the country and operating with such a large uh, student body and faculty, um, there, there are a lot of targets. There are a lot of targets for adversaries to hit. And um, I think beginning with those um, phishing emails and if that link is clicked, you know, take that 20 to 30 minute module training uh, to ensure that you you understand why it's important not to click on those links. If, if you have to click on a link, go into your browser and type it up. It's, you know, it'll take an extra five seconds, but it could save you from m malware, ransomware, phishing attacks, things like that. I think phishing attacks are just so, you know, complicated now, or not complicated, but even me as someone who, you know, is very on the lookout for that kind of stuff. I remember I took a spot the phishing quiz or something online and I and I missed like three of them. And I was like, wow, like it really would have, it really would have been that for me. So um, yeah, I think education on that is probably a foundational thing that everyone needs to know. And going off of that, also just understanding, uh, mutual understanding between the university and its students of how does the university use students' data and how is that data stored and, you know, basically what is done with our data. And I think creating that understanding would allow for people to have a better understanding of how other organizations might be using their data that might not have the best intentions. Um, and, and then also small things like, you know, ASU having free last pass for its students. I think that's something that should be shouted out, you know, off, off the A mountain to pretty much everyone on campus, because I think it's, you know, something that everyone should be using. And so, you know, those foundational things, I think, would definitely help a lot in terms of people understanding how cybersecurity really is involved in the things they do every day. Just a really quick, you guys brought up, you know, social engineering and phishing. This is really good. I'm curious, are there any other tools that you might recommend? This is something that um, obviously folks are always curious what kinds of tools they should be using. Uh, what kinds of tools are you guys using to protect yourselves online? I know someone mentioned Ghostery earlier as well. Yeah, we talked about password managers earlier. I think I, I mentioned that. And I, I used Ashley, and I know there's a lot of good password managers out there, but it, it can generate passwords for you and autofill and, and things like that. So you don't have to, because you, you shouldn't be reusing your passwords. At, like just bad if you get compromised in one area, then it, it can kind of affect all your different accounts. So having a password manager so that way you don't have to memorize, you know, 30, 40, whatever unique passwords is um, really helpful. So many data breaches are due to uh, mundane, insecure, or repeated passwords. So, you know, just like you were saying, Christopher, it, it really is um, such an importance to uh, kind of get to a place where you don't even have to remember your passwords. Absolutely. Yeah. Curious what browsers you guys are using right now. DuckDuckGo. <laughs> there you go. Claire, how about you? Duck Chrome. I also use it as my password manager. Might might be a bad thing, but <laughs> I used to use Chrome, but um, it takes up about about like two gigabytes of RAM on my computer every time I open it up. So I ended up switching to Opera, which is based on Chrome, but it's um, very similar. I'm a fan of using Firefox. Uh, I guess I might be in a minority here, but uh, Firefox does offer a few security features that are just built into the browser and it's very convenient for the user, which I found very helpful. It doesn't take very much to get it set up because it's just right there in front of you. Yeah, Absolutely. I actually use Firefox as well, so. Yeah. Yeah, no, Firefox is an old trusty. Uh, <laughs> what about, uh, what are your opinions on surveillance technology? You know, think about cameras, data collected in physical spaces. Uh, you know, uh, you know, is there, you know, is this, is this expected to you? Uh, is it an annoyance? Uh, what do you think the future looks like? Is it intrusive? You know, that's such a, it's such a fine line uh, between surveillance and privacy. And it's, 
getting harder and harder to determine where uh, privacy starts and surveillance ends. Um, you know, on one hand, surveillance technology is uh, fantastic and it could potentially um, mitigate a lot of crime that's going on already. Uh, for example, just a, just a year ago with the UK uh, Manchester bombing, um, CCTV was able to track down and identify um, the adversary. Um, and even, uh, I guess you could say, normal day-to-day uh, -day users with ring cameras now, um, doorbells that have uh, that camera on front so you can see who's outside. Um, but on, on the other hand, uh, how long does it take for that kind of technology to fall into the wrong hands? Um, you know, say a, a predator or um, a, a someone scary, things like that. Uh, and how long does it take with um, how much going on in this world already? Uh, how, how do we trust that surveillance won't um, kind of become that Black Mirror episode where everyone's being watched and won't take advantage of marginalized groups of people. Yeah, I agree completely. Uh, just a, a story from, you know, how I've seen that used in, in my community. Um, I live in Mesa and they have these mobile surveillance units and it's it's a little tower with cameras on top and flashing lights and there's signs all around it that says this area is under surveillance and they had one in a park and there was a stabbing there and they were able to catch the guy because of that. And so I, I'm looking at this like I, I can't disagree that that's a good use of surveillance. But then, yeah, when they can network people's like CCTV cameras and things like that, at what point does surveillance become an invasion of privacy? And is there a good balance? I, I feel personally like it's inevitable, but I just hope we don't take it too far. Um, and yeah, if we can find a good balance, I think there can be benefit in it. Yeah, just to quickly mention in terms of surveillance, um, we actually were talking about this in one of my classes yesterday, the idea of governments um, making or forcing companies to um, give them access to their users' data in order to solve a crime or, you know, be part of an active investigation. And our teacher basically asked us, you know, what do you think about this and do you agree or disagree? And as much as I do agree with the idea that it would be a very helpful thing for these organizations to have that information, the amount of um, potential threat and potential access that a hacker could use to get into those unencrypted data sources is just absolutely, you know, ridiculous. And so, um, and then also not to mention that, you know, allowing one nation state to be able to do that um, is, you know, it's very likely that other countries and other organizations might, you know, be subject to that same kind of treatment. Um, and, you know, there's some countries in the world where, you know, surveillance is very much a part of everyday life. Um, and we can't really, you know, do that in one country and expect it to not, you know, be something that other countries would want as well. Um, so that's something that was really scary to me because, um, you know, as much as I want to feel like that data is being used properly, um, at the end of the day, you don't know which person is going to be accessing your data and how they're going to be using that data, even if it is part of an active investigation or you know something related to that. To build off off that, I think I, it's really important to kind of understand that uh, for every camera, there's a person behind that camera. And as much as we would like to have it be a computer, in reality, eventually someone is going to check the footage and um, I think one of the real clear things that is really paramount in cybersecurity, and I we discussed it a bit, is that there should be a little bit of transparency involved. Um, I like the example that I think Chris used where, you know, the, the big radio towers, they had signs that this is being sur uh, surveyed. Um, if there's a camera in a public space, I think there should be a bit of responsibility to whoever put that camera to put up a sign that says um, this is being, you know, this is under watch, and that way you can you know, act accordingly in a way. Um, it's a bit um, inconspicuous, inconspicuous if there's a camera there, it's hidden and no one knows about it at all. And, you know, it's just catching everything. Of course, that's great for, you know, catching crime, but it also invades privacy so much that it's a real balance to try and, you know, compromise on these type of aspects. But in safer locations, I do think that having privacy in mind is definitely more key. I think we also um, need to think not just about surveillance, but um, like for what the government might do, 
But I think the big one, I think I saw it in the chat earlier, like the microphones picking up your voice and then using it as ads like five seconds later. Um, I think the bigger, like one of the, another really big issue is all of these smart devices that we're buying, which are great um, for um, helping maintain our homes. Like I have a Nest and I love it, but it also tracks when I leave my house and when, like what my, what my temperature settings are at. So, and that gets directly reported to the energy um, company. So making sure that we have acts, like we can, that I think is a more fine line between like privacy and then surveillance for corporate measures instead of security. I'm more okay with surveillance for security, but in order to sell me things, I'm a little, I'm not very okay with that. <laughs> You know, there, there's a really interesting piece of this that you guys have touched on and um, uh, Hallie kind of in, insinuated it or indicated it, but, uh, you know, there's a massive effort right now that I believe Amazon calls a uh, sidewalk and the idea, right, about, you know, these devices that boats have at their homes essentially connecting to each other and almost forming a, you know, a network of sorts, a mesh network of sorts of all these devices uh, in, in your extraordinarily on point about just the sheer implications of some of those things. You know, there's a lot here to cover, right? There's a lot to talk about. I really um, am really impressed and amazed at just the, the questions that we got about tools and, uh, and things like that. Uh, you know, not part of the program, but um, I would like to invite you. Just... Oh, and I'd like to. Um, We'll see what you can get done. I mean, I want to. Okay, there we go. Um, so I'd like to invite this uh, this group. Uh, you know, if you guys are, are so inclined, maybe what we could it might be interesting to maybe uh, put a list of tools together to share with folks, uh, especially uh, a more a recent list because, as we all know, the landscape is changing rapidly, and uh, uh, of course, uh, multiple reasons for that. The pandemic being one. Um, and then also just, uh, you know, you talked about, you know, some really interesting aspects of, of, of just uh, not only what the data means, but I think we also had a, a very evolved discussion about what the data could mean in the future. You know, there was that, that saying about uh, data being uh, sort of the new oil, but I think, you know, we're, we're really seeing something even past that. But, um, you know, as we're sort of uh, getting to the closing, though, there, there is one piece of food for thought that um, I recently heard someone flip that model on the other head and on the other way. And they said, well, does your data truly represent all of you as a human being? Right. So if Google has all this data about you and someone got this data about you, does it truly represent who you are um, or is it a glimpse into a part of you? Some interesting aspects of this. And, and just in closing, I'd like to ask you guys, you know, are there some topics or areas that uh, you think are, are worth bringing up that maybe we missed or maybe you're top of mind for you that you're like, hey, I think this absolutely fits in this discussion. You Anything? Know, Here you go. I think one of the main things is um, just trying to bring up those cybersecurity conversations with friends, family, um, acquaintances, whomever, those who don't necessarily have that insight that um, you or I might have uh, whether it's just simply starting up with that password manager or looking more into uh, behavioral authentication methods, um, different things like that, starting out small and uh, creating the environment where they feel safe to ask you those questions on, should I be doing this? Or is it okay if I click this link? Um, things like that, I think are really, really important to make sure that we are able to educate um, and bring awareness to uh, such a larger, wider audience of people. To expand upon that, I think right now is a perfect opportunity because all of us here in this meeting are in a very unique position that we're motivated to learn about cybersecurity and we've taken the opportunity to get into this meeting. And I think that we have a real unique opportunity to extend that this knowledge towards a bit um, to others. And I think, you know, take the time here to consider who in your life do you know that you're close to that is most vulnerable to these types of 
phishing attacks to these types of hacking maneuvers? Is it your grandparents? Maybe it's one of your friends that don't really care too much about this. And then just take that into perspective. And next time, maybe you can consider, hey, you know, it might not be important to you, but if you can, maybe it's important to me. So can you try and take these steps further, you know, secure yourself online in this rapidly digitalizing world? Yeah, I think something else that's uh, important for people to, to think about as well is, is backing up your data. Um, Cause you know, we talked about ransomware and all these phishing things. Like if, if you get ransomware in a computer but all your data is copied um, on another device, it's like, okay, I can just wipe this device, install a new OS and, and go about my day. It's inconvenient, but nobody's making any money off that. And if they can't make money off it, it might not be as um, big a target for them to, to try to do anymore. I think one of the other things also is having people understand the sheer amount of trust that they put into all these softwares and all these systems that they use on a daily basis and kind of understanding that. And also like Hallie and Song were saying in terms of using a password manager, even that in and of itself is a huge amount of trust that you're putting into that company to be able to secure pretty much your entire, you know, internet footprint when it comes to, you know, the ways to get into the different softwares you use. Um, So I think, you know, trying to, motivate and create that understanding between people of, you know, how much trust are we really putting into this company? How much trust do we give to ASU, to these password managers that we use, to um, Google, to Facebook, whatever the case may be. Um, And I think creating that understanding will definitely be a motivator for a lot of people to, you know, care more about cybersecurity and digital trust. This is, this is really powerful. Oh, Claire, please. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, I was just going to build up on, I think the entire basis of cybersecurity is, um, one word is what we've been saying this entire time is trust. Um, So um, not only that, but especially, um, I'm just going to keep bringing up Twitch because it's very relevant to me today. Um, But you also need to realize that when you're trusting a company, um, many of these like sites like Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, which Amazon, they allow you to log in to other websites with their connections. And so that's a big thing for my kids right now um, is many of their accounts are linked to their Twitch account, but then your Twitch account is also linked to your Amazon account. And Amazon has Amazon Web Services, which is, so it's everything is connected and you need to make sure that you, when you trust one company and then you hit like, yes, I want to connect with this website, you're trusting that company to then manage another account with that data as well. So it's just a big, like, it's a big web. That's why it's the web. You know, you guys leaned in on the word and theme of trust uh, so uh, so well. I think this is just a, Donna, I think if there's anything, and then sharing just with the entire group, I think if there's anything we have heard here, uh, it is that trust is definitely an expectation uh, and definitely a, 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 a core aspect of cybersecurity and just the future relationships that uh, you intend to have with organizations, whether they be your schools or your employers or, or other organizations that you're a part of. Um, this is massive uh, right now. And as you all know, digital trust is a, a pretty big discussion in cybersecurity and, and, and not everyone has it all figured out. Uh, but this group uh, seems to have some incredibly amazing thoughts, very fresh perspectives and things that, um, ideas that I think really will help us uh, in the future. Uh, another a- a piece that I really want to encourage this panel to think about is that Cybersecurity leadership is a, an area uh, that the field is still trying to really make meaning of. I see and heard a lot of, uh, of, of interesting, strong pers- perspectives of strength and leadership, resilience, uh, empathy, emotional intelligence, um, paying attention to humanity, uh, wanting to tell the kinds of stories that your grandparents and family members can understand uh, in these really complex times. I mean, there's nothing that speaks to the future uh, more than you and the ideas that you've shared here. And there's nothing that speaks more to just the power of the field that uh, that you're in. 
Uh, I think we know where we're, uh, where we're going to be looking for our next talent and the future leaders uh, of our space and our industry. So thank you guys so much for this time. Uh, I, and I just want to invite you to, to consider, uh, you know, the connection channel uh, with, with me and, and, and everyone on our team as being as open as possible. Um, but thank you again for sharing your perspectives, your experience, and your time. Thank you. Really appreciate that, guys. Yeah, thank you for having us. Definitely, definitely. Um, well, back over to, uh, to, are we going back to Aaron or? I think I was going to fire up the slides, Donna. What do you think? Fire them up. <laughs> Thank you all Thanks. for your time. Yeah, seriously. This is a wonderful, wonderful conversation. And, you know, I think part of um, reflecting and thinking about the things that, that you guys have just discussed, we get to create this together. Um, I love the idea, uh, Song, it might have been you, um, mentioning about being critical of know, the digital experiences that we have, we should be. Um, and not only that, we should be in conversation about it. Um, if there are places where you're like, uh, I was posting in the chat, you're like, not cool, Amazon, be a sidewalk, um, or your own experiences with ASU, we want to hear that. Um, because trust is going to be built over time. You either build it up or you tear it down. Um, and we actually do that in the UX and the UI and the data uh, transitions and the data movement um, inside of our own systems. But we can, we can actually build that feature together. So I'm going to stick around for just uh, about 10 more minutes. If we have more questions, we can pop them in here. Timothy may also be sticking around for us a little bit if you've got some final questions. I would love to see all of you engaged in the kinds of things that we're going to have for the rest of the um, rest of the month. You can go out to links.asu.edu slash think, and there you'll see all the different activities. There's still activities that are even being planned because we're working four months out or four weeks out. Um, fishing activities, and uh, there's a wonderful, I actually don't know what the next slide is. I think the next slide is the one that I'm looking for. Yeah. Uh, Timothy will be coming back to talk to uh, Helen Patton, and Helen is now with Cisco Duo on the forefront of how we're thinking about multi-factor on our campus. Um, <clears throat> she was formerly the CISO at um, Ohio State University. And she's publishing a book in cybersecurity careers. She's had a really interesting career herself and has built pretty incredible teams um, and just has great insights about how to navigate your own cybersecurity career adventure. So that's gonna be on Wednesday the 20th. That's part of our regular Innovate session. Completely would love to see you guys there at that event. And of course, at all the events that we'll have a course across the course of the month. All right, I think that's our last slide. That it is. Well, thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, thank you for this kickoff of our cybersecurity awareness. Um, you know, I many thanks to Michael Palmer for joining us um, and squeezing us in between board meetings there on the East Coast this morning. Um, it was really inspiring and incredible story that he's got and some really wonderful, not only experiences, but I don't know, book reading for the, the rest of the month, a couple of fantastic books. I think team, we're, we're gonna be able to take some of these um, links and make them available. Kind of think through what ways we might have to be able to do that. 